The 2018 Kansas Legislature appropriated certain funds to be used for a mental health intervention pilot program. Dr. Randy Watson, Commissioner of Education, is signing necessary memoranda of understanding, or MOUs, with school districts that have been selected to participate. USD 259 has been selected and has entered into an MOU with the Commissioner. The MOU provides that the Commissioner will pay funds appropriated by the state to USD 259 to fund the cost of USD 259's operation of the program. A portion of the funds allocated under the MOU to USD 259 is designated to be used to compensate ComCare for services that ComCare will perform under this agreement. The ComCare agreement is with Sedgwick County. Tonight's agenda item will include a presentation about the pilot program. It is recommended the board approve the mental health intervention team pilot program contract with Sedgwick County. And we do have a speaker on this item. Do we want to have the speaker first or at last? First? We typically ask the speaker to. I think he's coming right back. Um, never had a speaker leave. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. Uh, We'll give him a minute here and see what happens. All right, I'll reread this. Public comments are limited to board BOE agenda items and within the jurisdiction of the board. Speakers' comments are limited to three minutes on a registered topic and will not include personnel matters concerning district employees or matters that would violate privacy of students. Dr. Chaplin. Chairman Rohde, good to see you, sir. Good to see you. And our fine superintendent. I wanted to come and speak to you just very briefly and bring my prop. I'm a science teacher, right? We've got a problem throughout our country. We put a lot of emphasis on our teachers. We want them to take care of every problem that comes forward and we want to say to them, okay, now you're in charge. That's fine. But it takes not only the teacher, but the parent and the student to have success in the classroom. Our teachers are not paid babysitters. I have found when I served on the State Board of Education that many times teachers would come to me, they'd give me their first name, but not their last. They wouldn't tell me what building they're in, but they're just shaking in their boots because of the disruptions in their classrooms. Now, last year we had over 50,000 referrals of kids from the classroom to the principal. I have had teachers come to me in the last several months prior to the close of school in tears. They don't want to go back to school the next day. They're frightened of what the kids are doing in their classrooms. You report the kids to the principal. The principal doesn't do anything. They're back in their classrooms. They want transferred or they want to quit. Now, I'm here to talk about mental health of our teachers, our staff, our kids. It takes all three of these for this to work. We've got to get the parents and the kids engaged. Look what happens when you take one of those legs out. We can't put all the emphasis on just the teacher. We've got to back them up. So what I've provided you with is a little piece of paper. On one side, you're going to see a bunch of data from when I was on the state board of various types of violence in our classrooms, 
and we have a total over in the far right that shows in the year of 2010-11, we had 1,052 reported incidents of students. When I served on the state board, I looked at that data, and then I got an internal document that showed it was actually 5,000. It was under reported five times. Now, you've just had a discussion here about Metro and about some other things for graduation. Whether that'll make any difference, I don't know. But we're in a position right now, we've got to increase the graduation <laughs> rates and also the scores. Only 20% of our kids scored proficient in math in Wichita, and 25% scored proficient in reading. This is not just a problem for Wichita. This is a problem nationwide. But as this board takes this serious and looks at it, this mental health grant is wonderful. Please approve it, but it's a baby step forward. We've got to move on all fronts and make sure we take care of our teachers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Welcome. Thank you. President Rohde, Vice President Logan, school board members, and Superintendent Dr. Thompson. Uh, we are excited to discuss our new uh, mental health pilot program. Uh, we have coined the term or coined the name Kansas Opportunity Support Program Pilot. And just want to give you kind of a highlight of the program and kind of walk you through the program. It aligns with our strategic themes, and we put the three themes that it really aligns with. Uh, ensuring success for all learners and support the whole child and engage family and community. The goal, and this is taken straight from the proviso, the goal is to provide treatment and track uh, the behavioral health of two groups. You have the alpha group, which consists of youth who are uh, children in need of care or in state custody, foster care contractors, um, and then you have who have experienced multiple placements that may range from one end of the state to the other. The second group is the beta group. It consists of youth who may have moved from time to time but are just as likely may reside in one school district throughout their education. Uh, these youth who need more behavioral health treatment outside the normal school day. The staffing model, there are three uh, individuals that will make up the behavioral health intervention team. The first person is the school liaison. This is a district staff person responsible for the referral process serves as a liaison between the district and the community health uh, center, and then communicates and monitors the implementation of the student's treatment plan. The second is the clinical therapist, and this is an employee from ComCare. Uh, they're responsible for the clinical assessments, the development of treatment plans, the intervention services, including one-on-one -on -one group family uh, therapy, provides the mental health triage for students. The third individual is the case manager, Again, an employee of the ComCare. Uh, they're responsible for the family engagement and outreach, participates in the treatment planning process, coordinates intervention services, such as one-on-one -on -one group and family therapy, and supports in the mental health triage for students. So the referral process. Those students who are in the alpha group will be coming from our foster care system, uh, coming from foster care families, and then kids who are on probation, coming from JDF or JRF. Um, all students involved in the foster care systems are automatically, if you will, involved in the program, as well as students who are returning from JDF and JRF. The beta group will be referred from parents, counselors, teachers, administrators, and these are kids who are not currently in the system who need extra support with behavioral health uh, supports. Uh, students experiencing their second reassignment hearing. All referrals are made to the school liaison. Uh, and that's taken then to the behavior health intervention team for a prioritization and or acceptance into the program. So once a kid is actually uh, in the program, the liaison will contact the parent to set up the meeting. One of the things that we found is that our parents trust our public schools. And so we want that initial contact to come from a school employee. Um, we bring the families in uh, along with the um, case manager and the therapist and consent, all the paperwork is signed at that intake meeting. The next step is that the mental health um, therapist then uh, gives a clinical assessment to the student, 
After that assessment is given, the behavior health intervention team then develops a treatment plan for the family and the student. The school liaison then communi communicates that plan to the family. The case manager communicates the plan, excuse me, the school liaison communicates the treatment plan to the school personnel. All the teachers are involved, all the counselors, the administration. The case manager communicates the treatment plan to the family so that the family knows what's going on in that treatment plan. The treatment plan is then implemented with fidelity. The school liaison conducts uh, student observations both in the classroom as well as in the hallway. So they're checking up with the student ongoing throughout the process. The clinical therapist implements the actual intervention. The case manager is able to host lunch groups. We do a checkup every four weeks to modify or continue the treatment plan as uh, developed. The case manager, after the four week checkup, the case manager is then responsible for communicating with the family, uh, any changes to the plan, uh, as well as if we're just continuing the plan as written. The school liaison then communicates with the school personnel. So there's always that feedback loop is always there, both with the school and the community or the, the family. Treatment plan then continues. What kind of you know, interventions or the types of interventions that will be provided? We have one-on-one -on -one, um, counseling services that will be provided through the school day by the clinical therapist. We have lunch groups. We have in-class behavior interventions. That's visits from the therapist or the case manager or the liaison. We have de-escalation emergency episodes where we develop an actual de-escalation plan for kids so that when a kid is triggered, we are actually have a plan in place to get that kid back regulated so they don't miss or miss as little instructional time as possible. Suicide crisis intervention. Then we have after school group sessions as well as after school family therapy sessions. So providing that wraparound services uh, for our kids. When you talk about the uh, lunch groups, it could be something such as kids who are experiencing divorce and having a group of kids who can come together and process that. A third grader who's going through that needs that processing time and will provide an adult who can kind of walk them through the steps, walk them through the grief process, different things like that. And so that's what will comprise the group sessions during lunch. The evaluation and checkups. Again, treatment plans will be uh, reviewed every four weeks. We'll have data collection on grades, behavior, and attendance. Uh, at the end of the quarter, October 19th, December 19th, March 8th, at May 8th, and then May 23rd, we'll actually have data on the kids who are in the actual pilot program. The program hours, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday are open during the normal school day, or nine to five for elementary, and then eight to four for middle school and high school. And then Tuesday and Thursday, we actually flex the day. We consider that our family therapy session. Elementary will run from 11 o'clock to 7 p.m. in terms of the building being open and services provided to kids and families. For middle school, it will be 10, 10 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And so we'll have uh, the therapist to flex their day on Tuesday and Thursday so families are able to come in after they finish work and be able to do family therapy uh, with the therapist. Schools that are involved in the pilot, uh, for elementary, we've got Gardner, Dodge, Cessna, OK, Isley, and Allen. For the middle schools, we have Truesdale, Hamilton, Meade, Jardine, Marshall, and Stuckey. For the high schools, we have Heights, North, West, South, and Southeast. And for our special day schools, we have Bryant, Griffinstein, Wells, Sowers, and Gateway. Schools were strategically selected. Uh, most of these schools have either a large population of kids who are in foster care or they have like a group home in their boundaries or for the Heights and Stuckey, they have the actual children's home that sits right there uh, in their boundaries. And so we wanted to be strategic to make sure we were providing services at the schools that we knew had the highest population that we were targeting in this effort. Inside your packet, you also have the uh, referral form that's there. Again, that could be filled out from a foster parent or a teacher or a counselor or an administrator or a parent. Uh, the second form is an actual treatment plan where we have the goal, the behavior that will be addressed, the actual intervention uh, that's listed, the frequency of that intervention, as well as the person who is implementing the intervention. The next sheet you have is the 
treatment plan review. Again, we want to look at, at the frequency to make sure that we're tracking how often the intervention was uh, delivered, and then the review and feedback of that intervention. Uh, and then we ask the question, was the intervention successful or impactful? Did it improve attendance? Did it improve behavior? Did it improve academics? And if so, why? If not, why not? And so being able to really uh, process that. And then the next step is, do we continue the intervention as written? Do we modify that intervention or modify that plan? And then when that decision is made, we rewrite the actual modification, and then that communication goes back out to school personnel as well as to the family so that we're always on the same page. The purpose of the program is to make sure that whatever intervention we are providing inside the school, we want the families to also provide that intervention at home. And so if we're talking about positive reinforcements, looking at five to one, we also want to teach the family how to provide positive intervention and at home. So they're also providing that five to one ratio uh, to students. Questions? Yes, we do. I'm going to start out this time. Uh, you talked about at the beginning that this, we were going to, are we going to be getting kids <laughs> statewide or is this a statewide program? This is a statewide program that is being piloted into six districts here in Kansas. Right. What the plan is for this year, these six districts, and then the following year, the six counties in which these districts sit in, and then the third year, subsequent years, to go statewide. So could we be getting kids from Western Kansas in this program? They wouldn't necessarily be coming here for the program. There's actually school districts in Western okay. Kansas that okay. are part of the pilot. Okay. So this is just for Wichita Public School kids here in Wichita. Okay. Um, what kind of double checks are there, you know, safeties in case a kid goes through the, the vetting pro process and we choose not to select them for the program, is there a secondary check to make sure that somebody didn't miss it? Is there another set of eyes? Is there anything like that? Good. Great question. Uh, if a kid was, say, to be rec referred and was not implemented into the program, that kid would probably be less severe, if you will, and so they would be on our counseling caseload. And so our counseling, our counselors and our social workers would pick that kid up and, and, and service that kid and, and track that kid. Okay, thank you. Stan. Uh, Terrell, um, we were just talking about restorative practice, and I know it's a big, big project at West High, <laughs> and when you were going through your program, it sounds like there's a little bit of uh, overlap there. Other than this is more official, that's more draft, uh, staff driven. Are they going to step on each other's toes in any ways? Or? Right. We don't see it as stepping on toes. We actually see this as another support. As we look at our kids, uh, we'll be able to, let's say that kid who's in a restorative process, who out there, as they're restoring, if you will, we'll have another group who can kind of walk that kid through the process in terms of what led up to the behavior, as well as being able to work on skill set so that that behavior doesn't recur. And so this, we see this as just a support to the restorative practice and a part of the restorative practice philosophy. And I got a trick question for you. Uh, so the, the same legislature that said schools have plenty of money gave us $5 million for mental health. Gave us, us $6.7 million for mental health. And it was the same, leg it was the same legislature that said you don't need any more money, you have plenty of money. <laughs> I'm sorry, you see, see I it's a trick question. I see the superintendent moving, and so I'm tail. being quiet. It was a trick question and you weren't meant to answer it, so thank you. Don't pull the tiger's tail. What I will say is we thank the legislators for providing us this opportunity to serve our kids. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Next speaker, Cheryl. <laughs> well, I, I, I really do thank the legislature because we're finally starting to work together as a team with yeah. our community partners. And that's wonderful. That's a win-win for absolutely everybody. So yes, we do thank the legislatures. I have just a couple of questions. One, I think I know the answer to, but I wanted to, it wasn't quite clear as you went through your, the program hours that you said where you have Tuesdays and Thursdays late hours, that's for the staff. That is not, our schools will run the normal school hours. Correct, and, and what that does, that allows our school buildings to be open right. so that we can provide the space for our families to come in. 
one of the things that we're finding this year with our mental health uh, services, many times our kids cannot travel to the actual agencies right. to provide the service or to receive the services, but we know they can get to the schools. And so we wanted to flex the school hours for the building to allow there to be a space, again, and a trusted space for our parents to come into to receive the services. Yeah, because all too often when we, our students have to go out, they not only miss the hour that they're getting the service from the community, they're missing a half an hour travel both ways. So they're missing you know, a good share of a morning or afternoon or whatever. Correct. So that's great, and, and you're, that's exactly what I thought you were gonna say. My second question is around the, um, the data that's going to be collected for these. I assume that we'll be collecting data for both the alpha and the beta groups and kept it, keep it for each group along with the results of what we're seeing? Because I know the states wants feedback, is this working, because they're thinking about if they expand, they want to make sure they're expanding the right things. Correct. The state is asking for the data uh, basically at semester, at the end of the year. We'll be keeping this data throughout. And so we're looking at this both at the midterm, the four and a half week mark, as well as the nine weeks and then the four and a half weeks. So we're always looking at the data to see the impact of what's going on. And that's why we have the four week checkups, if you will, for our treatment plans. And, and as that data goes to the t state, I assume that that will come to the board as well? Absolutely. So at semester and the end of the year? Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and my last question is, a student comes in because they've had a major trauma happen in their life and, and they need s extra support for a time. How are we determining how long we keep kids in this program? Because we have many kids who may need this service and a limited amount of service to provide. Great, 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 uh, great question. A, a kid could come and be in crisis in that moment, and this team could address that kid right there. And let's say that is just a one-time situation. That kid may not necessarily go on the caseload. We could address, bring the kid back to be regulated, and then refer that to the counselor, whereas a kid who may need ongoing services would be put on a caseload. We also have the ability that, say, let's, there, let's say there's a crisis at one specific school, we have the ability and the flexibility, we can pick up all of our teams move it to that campus to address that crisis right there in real time. So if we had a major thing happen in a building, a death or whatever that affected the whole building, w this could become a, a, an extra support for our crisis team that goes out to those buildings, correct? Yes, ma'am. Good thinking, okay, thank you. Good report. I have a, another couple of questions. I was looking at this list of schools and realized that there's really only one school on my district that's even on here, maybe, and it's on the fringe. Um, and I know of a couple schools that would probably benefit from this program. What was the criteria for choosing this? Again, we were looking at, stu at schools that had high, um, high rate of kids who are in foster care uh, to fit the alpha group, and so that was our, our driving force. And so we had data already in terms of where those schools, if you will, were located. And so we identified those. We would have loved to have provided this service to all of our campuses, but it is just a pilot this year. And so we had to be strategic in our selection. Well, I guess it's good and bad. I, I guess it's good that in District 5 we're mentally healthy. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just wanted to make sure. Second question, less, uh, less on the humorous side, I guess. You talk about Parent, inter, par, parent involvement, what if, you know, some, they're also talking about DCF, and there's no parents with DCF, how do we overcome that problem? Great question. Again, those kids who are in foster care, one of the, the services we're able to give is the wraparound services. So we're able to treat that kid and work with that kid during the school day, but let's say that kid has a crisis at 12 o'clock on a Friday evening and ComCare is responding, they'll also be able to communicate with our on, on campus staff so that on Monday morning, we're meeting that kid with support services when that kid gets off the bus. The other part of that is really spending time in those groups with those kids who are in foster care. Many times they kind of create their own kind of mock families, 
But with that, how do we work kids through that process that when they're leaving their quote unquote biological family, going into foster care and are already in crisis, how do we work with those kids and support those kids, but also the crisis of a kid who's been in foster care who's about to be reintegrated? How do we then process that? And so what happens sometimes is when those kids are in crisis or elevated, we see then behaviors escalate. Here's a chance to really support those kids and kind of walk through the process so that those kids realize they're supported, they realize we're gonna be there for them, and then we give them good strategies that they can use to better uh, uh, go through these processes. Well, thank you, and I think this is an excellent program. I think we're gonna do well with it. Ernestine. May I assume that you're gonna be the master juggler that's gonna <laughs> keep all of these pieces and parts in the air and going? Well, our, our student support team will be juggling this. It won't be myself, by myself, but our, our student support team, we're, we're ready to take on this, this effort along with our superintendent. Uh, she was very instrumental in terms of right. guiding this conversation. But I somebody believe, has mm -hmm. to do the juggling, and I know she's got a few other things that she's juggling. I'm, I'm gonna be the point person to juggle, yeah, yes. Right. If, okay. if that's your question, yes. Well, this is wonderful, thank you. And thanks to the legislature for having, and thanks to the legislator who brought this program because it's really an excellent needed program. And I'm just gonna reiterate, um, we have a team effort so I would acknowledge also our assistant superintendents and uh, our uh, assistant superintendent for student supports as long with elementary <laughs> and middle school and all of the members on our DLT team. So when we do projects, uh, we go into rooms and it's all of us and we hash it. Now yes, there are point people, but we definitely have a team approach to all of our projects. But I do want to watch Terrell juggle. <laughs> well, we can, we can put him on a show and, and send yeah. him around. Yeah. Cheryl. Uh, I just have a question, because you want a motion on a, th so that we can approve the memorandum of understanding tonight, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I am willing to make that motion that we approve the memorandum of understanding for the mental health intervention team pilot program. I will second that. I have a motion by Cheryl and a second by Ben. Hang on just a minute. Oops, we'll need to redo this vote, sorry. Just close it. Wait, wait until I tell you to vote. We're, we're training tonight, so. Just close it. And he's close doing it. a great job, we just need and to. restart the meeting. Begin meeting. We have yes. to restart the meeting? We hope not. <laughs> It's eight o'clock. We don't like want to start, start again. Start. <laughs> we have to do it all over again. Go to go to your special motions. I'm sorry. We could just do old fashioned and just wait mm -hmm. tonight. No, we can't. We have to do it electronically. We have to, huh? Okay. Yes. <laughs> We're just gonna wait until yes. he tells us. Oh my God! Just you gotta do it electronically. Hold on and converse amongst yourselves. Cheryl and Ben. Cheryl and Ben. Oh, I'm no, sorry. No, 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 no. no, no. Cheryl's Cheryl and Ben yeah. made the motions, yes. Cheryl, Cheryl moved and Ben seconded. Okay. Now you may cast your vote. Okay, okay, now you can go. See, I was doing something else. You said my name. I thought I was supposed to vote. I know. I, I just push it till I see it's blue. <laughs> Passes 6-0. Thank Time you. Time to get to work. Thank you, Terrell.